Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you to uh, a special session, which is co-sponsored by more people than I will be able to remember, the South Asia Studies uh, Program and the, uh, the South Asia Institute, uh, the Center for the Environment, uh, and Managing Adam uh, here at the Kennedy School. Uh, we're very uh, pleased to have today M.V. Romana uh, from Princeton. Um, uh, I want to congratulate Romana in particular. He is the recent recipient of the already announced 2014 uh, American Physical Society uh, Leo Zillard Award uh, for the use of uh, physics for public benefit in areas like environment and arms control and so on. I think it's uh, well-deserved. Uh, Leo Zillard, is, as many of you know, was an amazing uh, man. He's, among other things, the first person to think of a nuclear chain reaction. Uh, and uh, the person who drafted the letter to uh, Roosevelt that Einstein signed that helped kick off the Manhattan Project, but also a person who played an absolutely key role in civilian control of the atom and pushing for disarmament uh, after World War II, uh, which is a, a fitting award for Romana since he is interested both in uh, nuclear energy, which we'll hear about today, but also in disarmament. Uh, he has a recent book, uh, The Power of Promise. I, I would have uh, brought my copy to get an autograph, except it's a Kindle copy, so that it's <laughs> impossible to autograph. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> it's easier if it's a PDF than if it's a Kindle. But uh, um, what I love about Romano's work on nuclear energy in India is that uh, there's sort of, uh, you know, a great and powerful wizard up there saying everything is going to be fantastic. And what Romana is doing is not just saying, no, it's not going to be, but actually pulling back the curtain and looking in detail at cost, safety, regulation, et cetera. So without further ado, I will turn it over uh, to Romana. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks, Matt, for the very warm uh, introduction. Um, and some, in some ways a difficult one to keep, live up to. <laughs> I shall try my best. Um, so uh, this is, um, in a way, a book talk. Um, and I'm trying to sort of distill some of the stuff I did in my book. Um, but more, talk more generally about the future of nuclear power in India, in a way. And, uh, um, because it's, going, it's considered to be one of the major um, expand, uh, countries that's interested in expanding nuclear power. It has very ambitious plans. And it's good to sort of take a step back and try to see, you know, in what ways is this possible and not possible. Um, so let me just sort of jump into the subject. Can you hear me? Check or? Mic. I don't think it's on. Oops. Sorry. Can I put it up here? Put it up? Okay, I'm going to put the batteries in. Go ahead. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, let me just sort of jump into this. Um, by I start with when the nuclear program was sort of started. It was in 1948, uh, a few months after India won independence from, after two centuries of rule from uh, Great Britain. Um, and the fact that uh, it was set up at the, such an early period is a good indicator of how important Indian political leaders have held uh, nuclear power to be. Uh, it's a measure of their commitment uh, to, their, uh, to, the, uh, to the idea of um, having a, a large and ambitious nuclear program in India. Um, and, you know, in, in a sense, you can think of it as, you know, a country like the United States doing something um, as um, drastic in 1777, um, when at that time the country has a whole bunch of other things to, cons to deal with. So India was sort of going through a large partition of that problem. You know, there were all kinds of administrative questions that were looming in front of the uh, government. And for them to spend an entire session of what was called the Constituent Assembly, this was actually before the parliament was actually established. Right? So these are the people who are sitting and writing the constitution. They think it's important enough to actually set up an atomic energy commission at that point, suggest something to you. Right? And um, the person who sort of spearheaded this at that point was to become the first prime minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru. And Nehru sort of gives this wonderful speech saying why this is important. And he draws the parallel to steam power. And he said, you know, uh, India was a great country, but it did not develop steam power. And because of that, we became a backward country, a slave country, he sort of called it. And then he says, now the world is on the cusp of a nuclear revolution. 
And if we have to be, remain abreast of the world, we must develop this atomic energy, right? So when you set it up in that fashion, anybody who is going to oppose it will be seen as supporting going back to colonial times, right? And sure enough, this group of people, everybody is in support of this. Um, and that sort of generally been the way it has been in the Indian parliament with leaders and so on. It has been sort of fairly unanimous support uh, continuously over a period of time. There have always been significant uh, budget allocations. Um, it's been a foreign policy priority in many ways. And you know we won't talk about it today, but if you think about the US-India nuclear deal, that's actually an indicator of how important the, the, government, the foreign policy establishment thinks of nuclear power as uh, being to India. And um, in the aftermath of Fukushima, you know, many countries sort of rethought their commitment to nuclear power. India is not one of them. India was one of the countries that uh, assured that you know, we are going to be committed to nuclear power. And it was one of the first countries uh, to sort of approve construction of a new re nuclear reactor immediately after Fukushima. Uh, this was on, um, ironically enough, on the 25th anniversary of the Chernobyl accident on 25th April uh, 2011. Uh, and it was um, you know, the agreement to go ahead with constructing a, a large set of six EPRs uh, from France, from Ariba. Already in April of 2011. Yes. Wow. Uh, yeah, I mean, people <laughs> have been talking about it for a while, but yeah, just for the right. announcement to be made at the time, yeah. you know, it tells you something. Um, and you know, if it is actually constructed, it will be the largest nuclear park in the world. The currently largest one is in, is in Japan, Kashiwazaki Kariba. Uh, that's about 7,800 megawatts. This one will be about 9,600 megawatts if all of them are constructed. So, um, so that's, it would be an important thing. It's also an interesting place to have it. It's a sort of seismic zone and so on and so forth. That's another interesting question. But anyway, I won't talk about that now. Um, so, but all this is to just to say that you know, there's a government which is really, really committed. right? Uh, but if you look at, um, and then there's, you know, if you look at the media discussions of it, you know, nuclear power figures all over the place. Uh, but if you look at actually what is there, um, the, there are sort of a whole, the, the whole country is sort of dotted with nuclear, um, nuclear facilities of various kinds. I'll talk about a few of them in, during the course of my talk. You don't need to know that. Um, but what uh, there is is actually about um, 5.5780 5, megawatts of installed capacity. That includes one reactor which is just being started in a, in a place called Kurankulam down in the south. This is a Russian VVER reactor. And right now, it's still not at full power. It's only at 400 megawatts, but this assumes that it's actually there. Um, most of the reactor capacity is, is still not working? No. Most of the reactor capacity is um, uh, heavy water reactors based on a design that India imported from Canada uh, back in the 19, late 1960s and early 1970s. Um, there's also two um, uh, boiling water reactors, which are of the same vintage as the Fukushima Daiichi 1. Uh, it's probably the oldest uh, boiling water reactors which are operating today in a place called Tarapur, which is sort of north of Bombay on the west coast of India. And there is um, one pilot scale fast breeder reactor, and I'll talk more about that uh, later on. Um, and you know, there are a bunch of um, heavy water reactors under construction. There is the first uh, prototype fast breeder reactor, uh, which is supposed to be generating electricity, that's also under construction. And that's an important part of the nuclear program, so that's why I'm mentioning that. Um, and there are you know, plans to import a whole bunch of uh, light water reactors. But in terms of uh, nuclear power's contribution to overall power capacity, uh, it's about 2.1%. Uh, this doesn't include this Kurankulam plant, which has just come in. If you put that in, it'll probably go to about 2.4% or something like that. Um, and so, um, uh, the, you know, if, and as sort of looking uh, through my book, when I was working on my book, as examining, you know, what has been the share of nuclear power or sort of uh, overall capacity in the country. And for the last about two decades, it's varied between 2 and 4%, typically, right? around 3%, essentially. And you know, when you construct a new, when a new reactor comes online, it goes up a little bit. And then other plants get constructed, then sort of comes down. And that's been the sort of trend. So in a sense, as one of my friends joked, it's sort of like the Hindu rate of growth for those people who knew that. Right? It's sort of always been around 3% before the uh, reforms of 1991. So, you know, nuclear power share is sort of been around 3%. And if I had to put money on it, I'd probably say for the next two decades it's going to be there, right? Three, five percent maybe. That's about how it's, I would expect it sort of to go. Right? Are non hydro renewables really 12%? Yes. What, yes. What? Uh, wow. It has had a huge wind uh, capacity constructed. So, this is installed capacity. Right. But even in terms of kilowatt hours generated, 
they actually overtake that. They are of the order of 6%. I think nuclear would probably be about 3.5 to 4%. Hmm. So it's actually been growing dramatically. It's, the rate of new, uh, renewable energy growth, especially wind, has been faster than electricity growth in general. Right? Uh, so it's, it's been a, there have been a success stories. It's also India is sort of like the United States in a way that it is a multiple experiments going on in the same country at the same time. So different states do different things. And you see that in some states they really flourish, in other states it kind of fizzes off. So that's, that's what's happening. There's also a huge push to, uh, for solar energy. And uh, you know, that's, that's another story, but yeah, that's there. Okay, so if this had been the whole uh, story, then in a sense, you, know, you would not be hearing about nuclear power, right? It's 2%, well, who cares about it? And so the nuclear establishment, of course, realizes that. So one of the things they do is to say, you know, we are going to expand huge amounts, right? So this was a, a, a talk in 2008 uh, uh, by the head of the Atomic Energy Commission, the uh, Department of Atomic Energy at that point, um, a chap called Anilka Korkar. And uh, this was made, um, this is, these are projections, and they basically say nuclear power is going to grow by roughly 100-fold, right? It's going to go from 4.7 gigawatts, uh, which is you know, just as of two months ago, to 470 gigawatts. So two orders of magnitude by mid-century, right? That is the projection for the future, right? And um, so this is sort of, um, these are, um, because these are projections for, from the Department of Atomic Energy, you should first remember these are projections. And secondly, they also sort of reflect a bunch of, you know, assumptions that they have of the world, right? And so one of the assumptions you'll see is that exactly the question that Matt sort of raised if you look at their, the, the non-conventional, the renewable part, it's, it's going to destined to stay small for them, right, in their, in their vision, right? Um, and so there are, you know, there are different estimates. These are still estimates. I actually have this, but I, I yeah, I don't. It, it falls out of my hand as I gesticulate sort of furiously, so I'm to hold it. And also it's a laser. I'm always afraid I'm going to shoot into somebody's eye. <laughs> so I don't want to do that. All right, so the, the um, uh, the, uh, these projections are, are sufficiently large, uh, but if they were just projections, it'd be fine. The problem is, you know, the government sort of takes these as their template for what nuclear power is going to play a role. So um, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh uh, talked about this in 2009 at an International Atomic Energy uh, uh, Agency conference. Uh, basically, he said, you know, we are going to have 470 gigawatts by the year 2050. And in a sense, this was being the big, uh, you know, uh, statement that guided that guides the U.S.-India nuclear deal and things of that sort. Right? So, so it's not just a projection; it has a lot of political value. And so the question, so th this was sort of all happening in the sort of you know period when uh, there was a big debate in the country in, in the U.S. Uh, over the U.S.-India nuclear deal. Um, for those of you who don't know what that is, just a, one word about it, which is that. Uh, between um, 1974 and uh, 2008, India was not allowed to engage in nuclear commerce in any big way. Uh, uh, and in 2008, the Nuclear Suppliers Group created an exemption, especially for India, for, to allow it to uh, engage in nuclear trade. And this took about uh, three years uh, of sort of active debate in the country. And I happened to actually live in India at that point, so they're sort of very engaged in that debate. And um, you know, the, the interesting, there are a couple of interesting things which, uh, which are uh, happening in that time. One is that this was supposedly a deal over civilian nuclear power, right? But the whole debate, and there were sort of pages and pages of nuclear, I mean, newspapers and TV shows and stuff like that devoted to this, all focused on the weapons component. So why would you sort of have this on, on a civilian nuclear deal? Um, the positions broadly were, you know, there were sort of three kinds of positions. The government, which of course supported the deal, which basically said, you know, we, th we think the nuclear weapons program is good, the nuclear energy program is good, this deal is going to help the nuclear energy program and will not affect our nuclear weapons program, right? Then there was the opposition, uh, the Hindu Nationalist Party, the Bharati Janata Party, uh, which was unhappy that they didn't were in the party in power to get the deal in a sense, and so they basically criticized the deal. And they said, well, you know, our scientists are smart guys, they don't need anybody's help, and this deal is going to spoil, is going to remove the flexibility in determining our nuclear deterrent. This is the language of the former prime minister. Uh, but of course, flexibility doesn't mean low coming down. Flexibility only means going up. 
Uh, but anyway, so that their opposition was this deal is bad because we can't build up our nuclear weapons, we can't test nuclear, new nuclear weapons. So this is a bad idea. And then there was another uh, camp, the, the left parties, uh, the Communist Party, Marxist, and uh, CPI, uh, which basically said, no, this deal is a bad idea because it is, you know, it's an imperialist deal. Uh, it's a sort of thing with the United States. We don't want to enter into any kind of truck with them. They will ask us to support them on Iran and so on and so forth. So all of course happened. Uh, but we don't want to have a part of this deal. But all these mainstream positions basically assume that nuclear power is a good thing and we want more of it, right? There were a bunch of people who are not in the room, who are sort of the activists outside, who were basically saying, uh, you know, nuclear power is evil, it's bad, it's undesirable for a whole bunch of reasons. But none of them actually asked the question, you know, is this at all possible when they are saying that this deal is going to help India grow its nuclear power by a factor of 100, is it going to happen? Right? How likely is this? How feasible is this? Right? And so that is the question which I was sort of actually interested in, in a way. Um, and uh, the second thing which I would want to say is that, um, you know, the moment I ask this question, in a sense, you know, you all know what, what my answer is going to be, right? And certainly if I had given this talk in India, everybody would be sort of giving you this very knowing look, saying, you know, ah, I know what you're going to say. And for a good reason, right? They'll all say, oh, this guy's an anti-nuclear activist. And then of course I'll say, no, no, I'm not anti-nuclear. And I don't like to be called anti-nuclear because, A, you know, you don't describe Kakorkar as a pro-nuclear scientist. Why do you define me that way? But also because I don't necessarily think of nuclear power as being an evil thing. I don't have a moral position against nuclear power. It's a cost-benefit risk sort of calculation. You can come out on either side, right? And just like, you know, I decide not to buy a certain car doesn't make me anti-car, right? I can just kind of look, I think it's better to go on the T. It's much cheaper, whatever. Anyway, so it's... But then the reason why they would sort of look at you and say knowingly that it is not the thing is because this question never gets asked except by people who are sort of somewhat suspicious of what these guys are saying, right? So there's the whole thing. And so I don't have to sort of tell you what the answer is. The answer is going to be no, right? But uh, my, the answer is no because uh, of a whole bunch of factors. And this is what I sort of would actually like to spend the time talking on, why I think that the answer is no. Right? And I sort of divide this into five things, basically history, uh, the constraints from this technology, uh, nuclear technology, uh, opposition to nuclear power from sort of public, uh, the question about the breeder reactors, which I sort of will talk about, and economics more broadly speaking, right? Uh, so I want to sort of start with the question of history, right? Um, and um, so the, you know, the, the projection I showed uh, from Kakodkar earlier, about 470 gigawatts by 2050, is, is just the latest in a whole series of these kinds of things. The first time that uh, I know of when such a projection was made was in 1954, right? And um, the context was that, uh, so this was again the early years and uh, you know, 1948 was when the program had been set up. And by 1954, uh, people who had been um, critical of both the way the program was set up as well as um, partly because they were excluded from being in the inside circles, um, they were leveling a whole bunch of criticisms. Basically the question was, you know, we've, we've been giving you a lot of money for this, you've been getting money from the government, what are you doing, right? Have you set up a nuclear reactor? No, right? So at that point, basically the um, head of the Atomic Energy Commission, Homi Bhabha, um, he sort of comes up with this three-phase program, which I'll talk about, right? And basically saying, you know, don't worry about the present. Sometime in the future, we're going to have a huge amount of nuclear power. You don't know what you're going to do with it, right? And so that was the first time. And this kind of keeps on getting uh, repeated time after again. Every few years, there'll be some, you know, updated projection. Remember what he just said. The three-phase program was created in 1954. It's still the basic yeah. idea. It's, yeah. it's, I can't think of another technology of which a similar thing could <laughs> right. be said. So I'll, I'll talk about <laughs> that in, in, in some this thing. Um, so the... the you know, so there are a series of these projections, right? And the highest that sort of I've seen in the past uh, came around in, in 1970 uh, and 1970, 71. There was a, a big uh, report that came out and they basically talked about 43 gigawatts uh, by the year 2000, right? And just for sort of reference, the actual capacity was down there, right? So it was about 2000, uh, gig or two gigawatts, right? So about a factor of 20 smaller, a factor of 5%. Um, and most of these things were based on this fast breeder reactors. So the upper two bars are all sort of um, <coughs> fast breeder reactors, right? Um, and I'll talk about fast breeder reactors in greater detail, so let's just hold that thought. 
and uh, you know these plans have not materialized. Now it's this is something which everybody realizes. So if you ask somebody from the Department of Atomic Energy why is this the case, um, they usually will have an answer. Their answer is you know in 1974 we tested a nuclear weapon because they would call it a peaceful nuclear explosion, uh, and they'll say you know well this basically the entire West sort of got against us. They stopped giving us any kind of nuclear technology. That kind of slowed down our program, right? Now that's good. So maybe that's that it is true also that you know there are many many projects which were quite delayed because they stopped being able to get a whole bunch of small things, right? So it could be some small instrument that is going to be used to measure the neutron irradiation in some particular part of the reactor, right? If if you can't here, you could just go out into the market and buy one uh, in a matter of a few weeks. But in India, you had to sort of develop it from scratch. So obviously, it is going to slow down the program, right? But what it did do was stop their penchant for making these future projections again, right? So uh, about a decade after that, the uh, Department of Atomic Energy came out with another uh, projection, this time 10,000 megawatts by the year 20, uh, 2000, right? Uh, so they all like these nice loud round numbers um, which come up usually. And so this sort of talked about a whole bunch of you know, uh, heavy water reactors and um, um, then a bunch of scaled up versions of the heavy water reactors as well as you know the starting of the fast breeder reactors. The problem when you're making this projection in 1984 is that you had experience with the earlier projections were all made when there was not a single megawatt of nuclear electricity being generated except for that last 43 uh, gigawatts. The first two reactors had just been installed at that point. Uh, by this point, India had constructed a couple of these things and was having severe delays in a whole bunch of others, right? So you should know that this is not going to happen in a sense, and then you're going to start, map, you know scaling up the technology and starting up a new thing, you don't do that, right? So you don't have a lot of self-reflexivity within the organization, right? Uh, so uh, so you, they, sure enough, they sort of uh, don't meet this. Uh, but what is more interesting was that in 1999, uh, the Indian Comptroller and Auditor General, which is sort of like the GAO here, uh, the Government Accounting Office here, um, sort of did this report looking at what happened to this plan, in, which you uh, did in 1984, and they had given them that large amount of money, 5,291 crores, which is 52 billion rupees, all right? Uh, 53 billion rupees uh, had been dispersed. And whatever had been promised for that, nothing had been delivered. Nil was the word they used uh, in terms of how much was, was delivered, right? So it was a pretty shocking indictment, of course, in that case. Um, and so you sort of come back and say, oh, look, you know, there is no way you're going to make this 470 gigawatts by, by 2050. But there's actually a reason why they sort of do this, I think, uh, why, why these projections have been missed. One, one case you can kind of say, you know, this is just wild projections. But there have actually been sort of real problems with each reactor, and I'll sort of talk a little bit about that. Um, so this is actually what I mean by saying these are problems with the technology, right? So if you look at every reactor that has been constructed in India, every one of them has had cost overruns and time overruns. The time that is they are projected for construction, the cost they are projected for construction, each of them has been exceeded, right? And um, I think the important reason for this was that in each case, almost in each case, new sets of problems have arisen, right? Which had not been envisioned in the past, which had not occurred in the past, right? So, for example, you can start with these heavy water reactors. So, the first reactor was constructed in Rajasthan, which is imported from Canada. So, you know, it's the first time. So, you know, you have to sort of you can, you can excuse why that's late. The second set of reactors were constructed in a, in a place called Kalpakam, which is south of Madras, uh, where I grew up. And um, they were essentially clones of what was being uh, constructed in Rajasthan. Now, the, uh, however, the, there's one crucial difference. In Rajasthan, the reactors get water to cool the reactor from a, a lake, an in, in, inland lake uh, called Rana Pratap Sagar. Right? In, in uh, Kalpakam, on the other hand, you have to get your water from the sea. From the Bay of Bengal. Now, the Bay of Bengal has a peculiar problem that um, it has something called littoral drift. That it actually, uh, as the water comes into the coast, it rakes up a huge amount of uh, sludge from downstream, not sludge, but you know, uh, mud and other kinds of things, which end up clogging up the pipes. So, when they have to draw in water, you have to put a pipe that goes about two kilometers into the sea. Right? This is not an easy thing for them at that point. So, that delays that project. We have the same thing at Seabrook. Exactly. Yeah. So the next project is in, um, in a place called Narora, sort of not far from Delhi. There, there's a new problem, which is that this is a seismic zone, right? 
of course you can ask why do you sort of select that place and the reason has to do with you know mrs indira gandhi who was the prime minister wanting to do better than one of her local party local rivals chap called charan singh whose government who's who was a local ruler there so he says okay i'm going to put a nuclear power plant and try to win over all the local elite to my side right so that's the reason they choose that plant but because it's a seismic zone they have to redesign a whole bunch of reactor internals to put snubbers and things of that sort and this takes up a lot of time the next plant they will lose is in a place called kakrapat now here the area is not seismic but it's actually <coughs> prone to flooding right so they try to put a whole bunch of earth there and raise the thing and then eventually of course it does get flooded that's a different issue right uh, so each place they sort of come up with new sets of problems like this the the next plant they they constructed is is in a place called kaiga um this is probably the only place in the world where there is a a plant in a sort of a really tropical forest in a sense right in the middle of the forest they've sort of constructed this and so there's a huge anti nuclear movement for the first time there've been earlier movements a little bit opposition movements but here's the first time when a whole bunch of local government sort of pass resolutions against the plant the local people are against the plant uh it goes up to the state level there's the first time there's a case that is instituted in the supreme court uh, of india the supreme court actually for surprise actually sides with the people who are uh putting the case but except these guys had worded their case so badly they kind of the case, supreme court says so oh, these guys have valid concerns and you should take them into account and the department of making says yes we take into account and they go on constructing the plant uh but nevertheless this was actually a pretty significant issue and then this is also the plant where uh they were constructing the containment dome and one day as they are constructing the whole dome comes down right because they had changed some design parameters and the whole thing con- uh, sort of collapses um uh be- fortunately before the reactor sort of started operation so there are a whole bunch of things which happen in that kind of case anyway so i can go on and on in this in this fashion but the the bottom line is that you know in each of these cases there are new problems and planning does not allow for any problems to ever crop up so the assumption is that there's a space of problems you've exhausted all those problems and from now on everything is going to be smooth right and that's just not happening so they keep repeating that they also repeat the same thing in terms of the future right all the future projections say the same thing they are also uh doing a whole bunch of things which have to do with coming up with new technologies right so they're planning to import reactors from uh this uh, from russia from france from the united states one from uh, westinghouse one from ge you got to go got to learn how to each of these operate what kind of problems there are with that how to regulate them it's it's not a task which is meant for you know fast uh, delivery in a sense right um so this is going to be a sort of uh, repeated problem another issue which has sort of come up is this question of opposition i sort of mentioned that uh but essentially every project that has started since the 1980s uh whether it's uranium mining whether it's a new nuclear power project has sort of had local opposition typically what happens is opposition sort of flags up when the construction starts or when the decision to construct in a place and start acquiring land starts uh and eventually you know the people who are protesting either are forced to move out or forced to sell their land go in the cities and then kind of dies out as new people come in who are sort of tied in economically with this plant uh but nevertheless this has been there and um there are sort of two sets of concerns that drive this opposition one is sort of the familiar one about um you know concern about radiation and safety and so on and so forth but in india um as in many other developing countries land and water and so on are very important for people's livelihoods they are important here too but i think you know they are sort of even more people are much more on the edge there and so some of the resistance is very very fierce because of that because they see that this is just their livelihoods just go away they are not going to get employment in the plant they're not going to get you know they are often relatively rich farmers because these are all typically areas which have irrigation which are on the coast you know they're they're good farming areas typically right um and so this factor is something which you see in common with you know uh, automobile factories and you know all kinds of other things uh in the case of the nuclear industry i think it's sort of complicated by the fact that they're concerned about safety and you know since fukushima especially when everybody saw it all these things blow up on their television screens uh there's also been a huge lack of trust right uh, and but that's another story and i think presumably there's also less chance for the local farming population to get jobs than there would be at an automobile plant or exactly, something like that exactly exactly yes right. yeah so there are a whole bunch of factors why uh opposition is quite intense um and i think that uh, if you look at the profile of sort of the rate at which various projects are being set up and so on the second factor is certainly going to intensify with time 
Whether the first factor comes down or not is a different issue, but this is something which they have to sort of assume is going to be a problem later on. Most of the time, the opposition doesn't end up stopping the plan, though there have been a few cases where that's happened. Uh, there's been one in West Bengal, there have been a couple in Kerala, uh, there are maybe a couple of others which are sort of uranium mining projects which have been moved, things of that sort. Um, but they can certainly slow down the process, right? In whatever way they can try to uh, slow the process. A third factor is this question of breeder reactors, right? And uh, the plans, if I, if I go back to that slide, you'll see that a huge aspect of it uh, relies on breeder reactors. Breeder reactors are those which can, in principle, produce more fissionable material, more fuel than you put in, right? Um, so they usually have a core where uh, uranium or plutonium is getting fissioned, and then these things produce neutrons, and those neutrons are captured by uh, fertile material that's kept in the blanket, right? And if you design your reactor well, uh, then you can produce more fissionable material than what you use. So they are, it's a very attractive thing for a large number of people, you know, physicists really like that idea of being able to produce more fuel than you put in. Um, and so this is very attractive in, in many, many different countries. Uh, and the Indian government and, and the Indian nuclear planners sort of really have a great deal of faith in this. And as I mentioned, the faith sort of started in 1954, right? And this was a time when a large number of other countries were thinking of it. And ironically, the, the country which is, or maybe not so ironically, the country which has had the, had the very closely linked plan was France, right? And France, again, had this concern that they had this grand nuclear visions. Um, the problem was that they didn't have enough uranium on their own soil, right? They still had large amounts of colonial property in, in uh, Africa from which they got their initial uranium, and they still get it from Niger and places like that. Uh, but they were concerned that they're not, not enough uranium. And in general, around the world, there was this concern that uranium was going to run out. Nuclear power is going to grow so fast, there's not going to be enough uranium. Um, and so, um, but France, and so everybody, even from those early days, had their eyes set on thorium, right? So thorium was supposed to be this material which could be used in breeder reactors to produce other fissionable material, so the so-called uranium-233, and then you would use uranium-233 and that will sort of be enough and more for everybody. In the case of France, the thorium was to come from Madagascar, which was one of their uh, colonial these things. So Francois Perrin, who was the head of the French Atomic Energy Commission, he had written about this in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists at that point and talked about it in various places. And, uh, you know, at, at around the same time as Homi Bhabha was sort of saying the same thing. Uh, I don't know if there was any cross-fertilization or not, but it was sort of certainly coincidental in terms of time. Um, and um, so there was this plan that, you know, you would have heavy water reactors and then you would produce plutonium, you would produce... Uh, construct breeder reactors, uh, and then the breeder reactors would go ahead and, uh, you know, become, um, uh, produce more uranium-233 and so on and so forth. And, you know, as I said, at that, give, at that time, there was a lot of sense to this because the idea was that there was going to be very little uranium and, you know, nuclear power was going to grow very fast. So where are you going to get the uranium for it from, right? But what has happened in the years since that period is that uh, we've learned at least two very important things. The first is that uh, there is plenty of uranium in the world, right? We are not going to run out of uranium anytime soon, um, even if nuclear power sort of grows dramatically, right? There is no danger of that in the, in the thing. There may be specific countries which have relatively lower grades of uranium, and I'll talk about the case of India a little bit later, but even there, I don't think there's going to be actually a shortage of uranium, right? It's going to be the fact that you have to pay more for the uranium that you're going to produce. Um, the second thing we have learned is that breeder reactors are difficult and uh, problematic, right? Um, there is sort of, uh, there have been a whole bunch of um, uh, issues related to how breeder reactors operate, how, how safe they are, uh, and so on, which have made them extremely problematic, right? And so many, many countries which had had uh, breeder programs which still sort of maintain faith in a sense, like in Japan, uh, basically have realized that this is not going to happen anytime soon. So they all sort of put it off for the indefinite future. The, the cake, of course, goes to Germany, which you know, was constructing this Kalka reactor, which eventually they decided not to ever commission, never load fuel, and it was sold to a Dutch businessman who converted into an amusement park. Uh, so that is near the border with Holland, right? Uh, but if you look at actual breeder reactors, you find that most places they have actually done pretty poorly, right? Uh, and uh, there, again, the cake goes to a French reactor called Super Phoenix, which operated for about 11 years and produced enough power that it would have produced in about seven months. Right? Well, I, I would say the cake only goes to Super Phoenix if you're excluding uh, Enrico Fermi. Okay. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> it sort of had a meltdown had a, a few had months. Had a meltdown a few months after it started in the United States. <laughs> right. And the other thing, you know, even if you, and so, I mean, this has been a major concern because beta reactors are susceptible to a certain kind of uh, accident uh, called a core disruptive accident, where when the accident starts, it can set off positive feedback loops, which cause the reactor to, you know, go more, uh, accident to develop faster and faster, producing more and more energy, and eventually ending up in a small explosion. Much smaller than a nuclear weapon, of course, but nevertheless, you know, can be sufficient to break open any containment, right? So this has been a huge concern right from the early 1950s. Uh, but more at a more sort of mundane level, uh, if you look at any, any breeder reactor, you always find a whole bunch of problems. And especially problematic has been the fact that they have to use this liquid sodium uh, to cool the reactor for, uh, you know, because of technical reasons. And sodium, as uh, many people will know from high school chemistry, is a problematic material to deal with. It doesn't react very well with water or air. Uh, and so whenever there's a sodium leak, there's a problem. And there are also some reasons to think that sodium leaks are sort of inevitable in these things, uh, which have to do with sort of chemistry of how sodium interacts with uh, the stainless steel, uh, which has a certain amount of carbon in it, and so on. Right? So there, this may be actually a, a generic problem, which may not actually be solvable unless you go to a completely different set of materials. Okay? Um, but this has been a, a constant problem in, in, in reactors. And sure enough, in the, in the case of the India also, there has been um, this fast breeder test reactor that has been operating since 1985, uh, which has had a whole series of accidents. Right? So it took them about 15 years before they could operate for 50 days continuously without having to shut, it or shut them down. And about you know, the first 20 years, they had less than 20% availability. Right? And this is a reactor which doesn't even produce much electricity. Right? So, you know, if you scale this up, you're going to have, you expect a lot of problems. And the point, of course, is that, again, it's not about whether you should have breeder reactors or not, but if you want to base your energy strategy and your plans for enormous growth on this very problematic technology that is known to be historically very problematic, and, you know, do you really not want to revisit your question? And I think this also tells you something about organizational culture, that you cannot question a vision that your founder has given in 1954, right? And in, in, in practical terms, that is what it is, right? If you are seen to be questioning this and using some other strategy, you don't rise up in the ranks in the Department of Atomic Energy, right? So there's a, there's a little bit of sociological element there. Okay, so this is one problem with it. The second problem with breeder reactors, and this is again specific to India, is that it depends on a fuel chain. You have to produce large amounts of plutonium first to construct the reactors, and then you can produce more plutonium, right? But in order to produce that, you have to produce the plutonium first you have to, set, to set up these reactors. And if you look at how these guys do their projections, uh, there's not a lot of information, but fortunately or unfortunately, they have one paper where they put out some aspects of their methodology and then their projections in some detail. So you can sort of sit and back calculate and figure out what they're trying to do. And the methodology is a fairly standard one. Uh, it's, there's something called doubling times they talk about. How much time does a reactor take to produce enough plutonium to set up another reactor just like itself, right? How much excess the thing. And this is just a function of how your reactor design is and how long it takes you for you to process the spent fuel and so on. Now, if you look at uh, the Indian DAE's projections, uh, you find two problems with it, right? The first is that they don't have enough plutonium to start off their program as in the way that they wanted to, uh, this thing. But more important, the time that it takes for the plutonium that is, you know, the spent fuel that is taken out of the, uh, of the reactor and then reprocessed and made into fuel to put back into a new reactor, it takes a certain period of time, two years, three years, something of that sort. And their calculations actually does not include that time, right? And in, in sort of practical mathematical terms, what it means is that they use a differential equation and you got to get a nice smooth solution to it, which is like an exponential solution. But in actual fact, what they should be using is what's called a difference equation. Right? You have to take into account the linear discreteness that every year you have to do this kind of stuff. And it's a, it's a reasonable approximation when it was developed in the 1970s in the United States, where again, they used it to project all these vast growth, which didn't happen. But in the US, there was a big difference. There were already about 50 reactors, and there were you know, 100, of, 100 reactors being constructed. So there was not going to be a problem with plutonium stockpiles when the breeder program was supposed to be taking place. So the moment you, you know, you're done with one, you can reach into the stockpile and construct another one, 
Well, eventually there would have been. By now, by now right. we were supposed to be building 100 breeder reactors every year. Every year, yes. <laughs> That's right. So I, there was a problem at some point. <laughs> but, you know, if your reactors, yeah. But anyway, so, but that methodology, you know, if it had had some limited validity in the U.S., just doesn't have validity in a situation like India where the amount of plutonium is much, much smaller, right? So what happens actually if you do the DAE's methodology and you're just careful about keeping track of plutonium is that you end up with negative plutonium stockpiles. So I did this calculation, you know, this is how much you assume they have, and you run through this, how much do you require for, I mean, how much is being produced each year, how much do you require for the fueling of the reactors that are already there, how much do you require for new cores of new reactors that you're setting up, and soon you end up with a negative balance, right? Um, and, you know, in some question, the question that, you know, I tried writing to them and saying, look, can you show me your methodology? And they, of course, don't do it. Uh, but I suspect, you know, there's this sort of lack of peer review here, in a sense. Right? Um, but, um, you know, you can, you, you can look at this in, in different ways. You can kind of say, look, you know, you have to give them the benefit of the doubt and, you know, they can actually do things faster than they expect and so on. So you can, you know, play with some of these parameters. Is it going to take two years? Is it going to take three years? You can play with those parameters. But you can't bre uh, construct beta reactors when you have no plutonium. That's impossible, right? So that's, I think, a very central element in terms of how they do their projections, right? And so if you do the math more carefully and you make sure that you never hit zero, right, then what happens is that the projections come down by about 60%, even with very optimistic assumptions about how fast you can do this whole uh, reef, uh, constructing, converting into fuel. And if you sort of use more realistic things, you come down to about 80%, right? So that's actually the, uh, that's what, what happens. Difference. It's a huge difference. Now, uh, now I want to switch gears, uh, go to sort of my last set of points, um, which have to do with, um, how the, um, uh, why this breeder reactor program is important. And the, the main uh, motivation they sort of talk about is that India has relatively poor quality uranium, right? And it is limited uranium. When you say limited, uh, you have to ask, what are you including in that, right? So uranium, it turns out, is a fairly ubiquitous material. If you go into your backyard, you'll find some uranium, right? It's a very small amount. So if you try to actually get it out of your backyard, you'll be spending a huge amount of money processing a whole lot of soil to produce a small amount of uranium. So, but it is there, right? Uh, so when you actually try to make any kind of estimate, you have to make some assumption about what quality uranium you're willing to mine. The poorer the quality of the uranium, the more you can mine, right? But anyway, so the point is there, with certain sort of a set of assumptions about uh, what quality uranium you're going to mine, you have these estimates. Now, these estimates have been progressively going up year after year, right? Every, every two years, the International Atomic Energy Agency produces something called a red book. And if you look at red book figures, a, these are constantly increasing, right? So the amount of uranium that's out there is, is increasing. The problem, there, has, there was a problem in the mid-2000s when India had not yet been, uh, wasn't allowed to import uranium because of a mismatch between how fast they were setting up mining projects and how fast they were constructing reactors. That most, said, yeah. Most countries have more inferred resources than reasonably assured, rather than a yeah, third Yeah, I know, much. I don't. It's I have never understood why this is the case. <laughs> okay. uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those, um, I mean, there is no transparency in this. This right. is just figures that the DAE gives them. And so there are some peculiar jumps also. Which, which we're, are, we're working on a similar problem with respect to China. Yeah, but, yeah. I can quite imagine that. Um, but, you know, the, the one amazing side fact is that uh, what the uh, DAE will always say is that we only have enough uranium to set up 10,000 megawatts of heavy water reactors. And that's been a constant for 20 years. Uh, you know, though the amount of uranium that they have is going constantly increasing. But anyway, the, the, coming back to the question, so if uranium is, is limited in that sense, how would you sort of approach the problem? When is a breeder reactor sort of justified? Well, the, uh, if you think about it as like an economist, you would say, well, how much uranium is available is a function of the price. If I'm willing to pay more for it, then I should be able to get more uranium. I can mine more poor quality uranium. Uh, I can, you know, develop other things. And therefore, that, that is the question, right? So you can look at uh, these breeder reactors and say, you know, I compare that with a regular reactor, the heavy water reactor in the case of India, and try to compare how much it's going to cost to generate electricity in both of them, right? And because of a whole bunch of reasons that I talked about, it's not surprising that uh, breeder reactors are going to be more expensive. They are the, the electricity from breeder reactors. The electricity from breeder reactors is expensive for two reasons. One is that um, because of the safety problems that I talked about in terms of sodium leaks and the 
large accident possibilities, typically the capital cost involved in constructing a breeder reactor is higher uh, than that of a heavy uh, light water reactor or a heavy water reactor, right? It's roughly of the order of 10 to 20 percent heavy, uh, more expensive, uh, depending on what figures you use. These are figures are all over the map uh, in this case. But in this particular case, you know, what we used were figures that the Indian Department of Atomic Energy has put out for its own things, and you find that uh, the, um, uh, the heavy water reactor estimated cost for nuclear for new reactors is about eleven thirty four dollars per kilowatt, and that's extremely small by global standards. But that's the that's the official figure, and for um, for the breeder reactor is about thirteen hundred dollars, right? So um, so only twenty percent more. It's about twenty percent more, right? Um, and uh, but then uh, of course the, all these things are going to go higher. That's a different issue, right? But hopefully they're both going to go up in parallel, and in more likely the breeder will go up higher because it's a new technology in a sense. It's the first time they're constructing one of these things. Um, and in fact, so far the breeder cost estimates have gone up by about forty percent, and the reactor is not yet commissioned. It's uh, I think now four years behind uh, on its commissioning date uh, at this point. Uh, nevertheless, these are the sort of official figures, and you find that it's about 80% more expensive, right? The second factor, which is actually very, very important, which is uh, in a sense different from a whole bunch of other countries, at least the studies that I have seen, is that the costs of dealing with the plutonium and producing it into a new fuel actually are a very substantial fraction of this difference in cost, right? Uh, the plutonium uh, chain, in a sense, uh, actually uh, contributes about 40%, I think, or something of that sort. Um, not 40%, I'm sorry, I forget the figure. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly significant factor. And that's driving the difference, in a sense, rather than the capital cost. So I, then you can go back to the same question, you know, um, what happens if there is the uranium prices go up? Right? As the uranium prices go up, what you would expect is that the second column, the conventional reactors, the cost of generating power there is going to increase. And whereas the breeders use much more of the uranium, so they are much more efficient, so that cost is going to sort of stay more or less the same. It's going to go up much, much more slowly. And sure enough, you can see that the difference basically starts declining as you increase the price of uranium, right? But what you find is that the crossover price is about seven times what you are assuming at the current price, right? And this is, this is sort of Indian production rates. Indian production rates are relatively high because they have relatively poor quality uranium. $200 per uh, kilogram is, is on the high side, right? Uh, today's, I think, prices are about, what, $50 per uh, pound? Uh, no, thirty thirty six dollars per pound of uranium oxide. So it's probably about hundred dollars uh, globally. So this is you know much higher than even that figure, which is unusually high. Um, it will probably come back down a bit. <laughs> right. So so you know the the point is uh, is sort of twofold. Um, one is that uh, you know there is going to be huge amounts of uranium if you're willing to pay that kind of price, not just in India but around the world. Uh, the second is that. Uh, again, the, uh, it's not so much that uh, this cost is high, but that you're basing a program without doing this elementary sort of cost analysis and trying to figure out when you should be deploying breeders. So maybe breeders are required some point in the future, but it is way too early to try and do that, right? even if you believe in a sort of nuclear powered future. And so there is a problem there again. And again, I, th I think of it more of a, as an organizational problem than just a technical problem, that you have an organization which doesn't think about it. The only other thing which I want to say about the question of economics is that the way the many of these projections have been made about future growth is based on imported nuclear reactors from France, from the United States, and so on. Um, and uh, we looked at the cost of um, electricity from uh, this uh, plant in Jaitapur that I mentioned in, in uh, Maharashtra, which is uh, you know, decided in 2011, April. Um, and it turns out that the EPR is a particularly bad exam, bad reactor to be importing for the first time. Uh, I mean, or to have it as your first import, right? Because it's had a very troubled history, especially in Western Europe. The two sort of flagship programs for uh, EDF uh, and Areva um, were in one was in a place called Olkiluoto in, in Finland, and the other one is in a place called Flamanville in France. And both of them have been hugely sort of uh, cost and time overruns. Um, and you know, there's all kinds of interesting sort of legal games going on between who's liable for that and stuff like that. Uh, but you know, even if you sort of take into account the fact that you know, maybe they've learned their things and you have a substantial lowering of cost in India uh, just because of the fact that Indian labor costs are going to be lower, right? Uh, you would still find that you know, we sort of assume the middle line there, $4,000 per kilowatt, 
is the minimum they can sort of come up with, with about roughly about a 40 to 50 percent decrease in cost. Uh, just because this particular reactor type has been so much more expensive. And it is expensive for a bunch of reasons which have to do with higher safety standards and the number of loops they have and so on. But, you know, that's, that's how it is. And uh, what you find is that the sort of typical tariffs are roughly about three to four times more than from any other source of power. The, the current bids for, um, in their in the sort of competitive bids for solar power uh, have been around 7 rupees 50 paise per kilowatt hour, um, which I can't sort of quickly translate. It's probably about, what, 15 cents? Um, With some kind of a subsidy? or There's some subsidies involved, yeah. but not. Yeah, I don't think it, that is a significant fact. That has been dropping very dramatically as it has been around right. the world. And so this is about twice that, in a sense. Um, I mean, this is not quite apples to apples comparison. I, I would grant that. But nevertheless, it's an indication of you know, how high this is going to be related to everything else. Coal these days will be of the order of, again, um, somewhere between mm -hmm. 1 rupee 50 paise to about 3 rupees. So this is for an EPR. What about for the Indian native PHWR? Uh, yeah. That's presumably at least somewhat cheaper. They are, they are going to be much cheaper, yeah. So, but, but the reason I sort of focus on this is because this is the other big strategy they have. They want to import 40 gigawatts of imported right. reactors. So this is their second strategy in a right. sense. There's the breeders. The Indian heavy water reactors, they always say it's going to be only 10,000 megawatts. So right. they can't expand it much is their claim. Now, I think that's, again, wrong, because in principle, you can import uh, uranium from somebody else. And if you have a design that you sort of manufactured over and over again, you have some learning. And you know, to some extent, there has been learning. There's been sort of a progressive de uh, decline in cost. Not very significant, but still has been there. So that would actually be, you know, if you were a nuclear power enthusiast, that should have been your chosen strategy, right? And then you can sort of ask the question, how fast can I construct these? How fast can I manufacture heavy water? And you can make projections, and I think you can make reasonable projections. And my guess is what will happen is that you will end up with a growth rate which is relatively modest, right? And they don't want that. They want it to grow very rapidly because otherwise you're stuck in this 3 to 5% bracket and you want to somehow jump to 20% in the next few decades. So that's the, the most obvious strategy is not what they will actually emphasize, right? It's happening, but it's not happening anywhere at the rate at which it's going to happen. It should be happening, right? But I think the... The, the interesting thing about the Jaitapur project is that I think it's also, um, you know, we now know from WikiLeaks, you know, that great source of information, uh, that uh, this was a project that was promised to the French uh, during the course of this U.S.-India nuclear uh, negotiations, right? Uh, Kakodkar sort of goes to them and says, you know, we promise you one site and we, we promise the U.S. two sites uh, because they did a lot of the heavy lifting uh, and, you know, the Russians also get one site. Uh, so then all you figures can go out and support us in the nuclear suppliers group. Um, and so Jaitapur is sort of given already to the French, right? So they're going to construct that. And I think the, the interesting thing to ask is that if you were to think of this as your first prototype project, there has been a very sorry experience in the Indian power sector uh, in the 1990s. They constructed a, a plant based on naphtha, very close to actually where they constructed the Jaitapur plant. Uh, in, uh, and this is from Enron, right? And that basically killed the whole experiment of sort of having independent power producers without actually changing the sector substantially. So can you just, the question they were asking at that point was, can you get private capital into the generation end without actually changing the, the vertic vertically integrated utility structure that they have? And that basically was so, such a disaster that they gave up that experiment and they had to do a whole bunch of restructuring of their thing. Right? So the question, of course, is, is this going to sort of turn out that way? And the, um, the other sort of quote that I cannot sort of resist throwing out is from uh, a famous uh, economist called um, IMD Little from, uh, from England, who just died a couple of years ago, uh, who, pre who predicted way back in the 19, late 1950s that you know, if you're going to keep constructing these very um, high cost uh, power reactors, then you are you know, necessarily going to be power starved. Uh, it's sort of, a, I think it's a, it's a Interesting. I, lo I love that quote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here's, uh, here's, there's another uh, interesting um, economist who was uh, here in, in MIT who had a very acerbic quote also. He said, you know, if, uh, I mean, the, the claim by Baba and others was that India is a power-starved country, and so, you know, we need all sorts of power. Uh, and he says, well, if a person is hungry, you can pay a high price for a meal, but it makes no sense to go out and buy a restaurant uh, just because you're hungry. Right, and uh, you know, there's a little bit of uh, this thing there. Anyway, so let me sort of end there. I've sort of meandered enough, uh, and sort of leave the sort of couple of take-home messages. I think that you know the history has been 
pretty checkered, pretty bad. Um, and because of a whole bunch of reasons, nuclear power is unlikely to grow at anything like the pace that has been envisioned or it constitutes a significant source of power for the foreseeable future, whether or not you agree on the question of whether it's desirable or not. And that's a huge topic which I you know, don't want to sort of go into. At the same time, you know, I think that there are enough powerful people who believe in this and who sort of vested in this that continued support is going to be there. And, um, and so their outlook, in a sense, is you know, best captured by Scott Fitzgerald in this sort of thing that you know, somehow, miraculously, in the future, everything is going to be fine. So I'll leave you there, and thank you for your patience. All right, I have a thousand questions, but I won't use the prerogative of the chair. I'll As you, you may know, uh, the situation, uh, we talk about the power, uh, nuclear power projection projects. Uh, in China and India, we, we share some similarities. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, one interesting point, you, you mentioned the, the opposition uh, against the nuclear power construction mm -hmm. uh, is very different from um, between these two countries. Mm -hmm. I think in China, the local government, and usually they are really big for the, uh, the projects. Mm -hmm. that they really grabbed uh, the uh, say share of mm -hmm. the uh, whole plan to their own provinces or mm -hmm. the cities. So very different uh, dynamic in that sense. Yeah. Uh, that's my, uh, my com comment. And one uh, question uh, about, uh, you, you mentioned uh, so many factors uh, related to the future. Um, uh, you're, you're a technical person, so maybe you, you'll talk about um, more about technical perspective. But I, I'm, I feel like uh, maybe other factors also are important, uh, as crucial as the, the technical part. So, like do, do what? You, yeah, do, do, do you have any, uh, I mean, you, you judge w which factor is more important than the other? Yeah. Um, so so uh, let me first comment on the comment. Um, which is that uh, when I said uh, opposition, local opposition, I meant really local, right? People who are sort of in the area, in the vicinity of the plant. Uh, in India too, state governments typically have supported uh, nuclear power projects. And there is a political economy to this. So, uh, nuclear power projects are constructed by the central government, the federal government. And so the state government, any state where the uh, reactor is located, gets a certain the substantive share of electricity from that. So they love these projects, the state governments. The uh, opposition comes Because they get power without having to pay for it. For it, basically. exactly. Right. Okay. Uh, the opposition comes, and of course, there are huge numbers of contracts to be got and you know, the whole sort of uh, uh, economy of that. But the opposition comes from people who are going to be affected, either because there's an accident or because their lands are being taken or water from their sources are being diverted. And they can exert most pressure on the immediate local government, so the, the city level governments, the district level governments. Right? That's the extent to which their, their opposition has actually taken a governmental position. Right? State governments typically, there have been a couple of exceptions, and those exceptions have to do with such vast scale pro, uh, uh, protests that the state governments have had to say, look, you know, we reluctantly are going to say no to this plot. Okay? Um, larger, I mean, other factors, I think the way I would not. Uh, I think if I look at all the factors that I talked about, I would not consider them sort of technical, right? They are social, they are political, they are economic, right? So technical aspect of it, the breeder reactor is, is where I sort of, I can do the most calculations and sort of show off my prowess in a little bit. Uh, and it's also something which I can do better than most other people who are in this field. Um, I mean, in, in India, that is. Uh, but uh, but that's, that's only, I think, uh, that's just my side. I mean, I think the, the, the history was out there to be sort of looked at. Right? It's just one of those peculiarities of the, uh, you know, the state of debate in the country that nobody's sort of actually gone and dredged through these stuff. I mean, I'm not an archival historian to so go and sit and read all these things. I rely completely on secondary sources. Right? But you know, I think there are people who do some archival research, but there's a lot of stuff to actually look at. And you know, the other thing where I think I would really be fascinated, and I don't know how to do this, and I don't know anybody else is doing it, actually go and see what is the kind of state of debate in parliament and things of that sort. What you see on the outside is that it, there's no debate. There's no significant debate. But you know, surely there must be sort of stuff happening behind closed doors which are not going. And I'm not in a position to sort of answer that. Trevor. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ramana. As usual, uh, very convincing. Uh, you didn't mention the grid at all. So I can ask you how 
ele uh, nuclear electricity uh, fits into the grid. I mean, having been to India, I see that people actually steal from the grid without paying. So mm -hmm. there's something about the economics of electricity in India that, that worries them. And does that particularly affect nuclear, or is that a, a system-wide uh, issue? Yeah, I think it's a system-wide system -wide issue. Um, the, um, the failure of the grid to be able to, um, uh, okay, so the, the failure of the grid is, is sort of, you can divide into two parts of it. There are sort of technical uh, aspects of the failure, and there's a sort of what they call commercial losses, right, which is a, a, a euphemism for stealing, in a sense. Um, but uh, the, the, um, the, these failures, in some sense, can also be traced back to the fact that the uh, entities which are responsible for distributing power uh, in the pre-restructuring um, uh, era, they were called state electricity boards. After the sector has been restructured, you have dis uh, distribution companies, which have been sort of supposedly open for competition. In principle, the private sector can enter, but the private sector typically goes only to areas which are really profitable, which are the cities, right? But anyway, most of these discoms are broke uh, in terms of their finances for a number of reasons, right? Um, and there's a sort of larger question in that. But I don't think that has really affected the nuclear power corporation in any significant fashion, right? Their, um, a lot of their funding comes from the central government, uh, and I think the discoms don't have a lot of difficulty paying them off. I mean, they, uh, I don't think there's been ever a, I've never heard of a complaint that NPCIL saying you, you haven't paid me. There are a large number of small operators uh, who try to produce power who have had complaints about these distribution companies. This is an especially in a problem in the rural areas, uh, and there's a huge effort to sort of set up microgrids and other renewable source of power, and these guys you know, the, the interesting thing is that the, many of them don't even want to enter the dealing with the discoms. They say, look, you know, we don't want any subsidies. We won't, don't want to deal with these guys. We will just uh, produce power and sell it at a profit to people who are really, really poor, right? But they would still prefer not to go and deal with the discoms, right? So there is that. But I don't think that really affects the nuclear sector. I heard you next on the list. Thank you. Um, my name is Nathan. I'm a master's student at the Fletcher School. Uh, I think during your talk, you touched upon uh, like the whole history of the DEA and how they believe in all these impossible things which are completely contrary to empirical reality. And uh, like in the early stages of the atomic program, some of it you could explain by the fact that Omi Baba and all these like, elites, political elites basically, were, were invested in, in this program. But what do you think explains um, sort of the current um, attraction that, what explains the DEA's sort of influence on, on these, on Indian policymakers today? Why do they have so much influence? Like what, what, what interests really drive their, uh, their sort of over, their exaggerated sort of influence on India's energy policy? Um, what sort of interest groups that you feel like really sort of are pulling the strings that, or is it just a question of, we signed on to the nuclear deal with the US and therefore now we find ourselves in a position where you have to sort of, all those commitments that you made to get that deal, you're sort of going along, you just establish some sort of part of energy and no one really knows what's happening. Um, I think there are a couple of uh, different factors here. Uh, one is that at the highest levels you had mm -hmm. this commitment, and I think Manmohan Singh, the, the current prime minister, is a particularly good example of that. Mm -hmm. um, so Manmohan Singh, you know, in, in um, as one of my friends put it, you know, he had his first term in power was as a finance minister, right, in the early 90s. And he basically changed the sort of economic landscape in India. And in some senses, he feels the second term, the legacy of it is going to be a completely different foreign policy environment. And so he sort of tilted much more closely to the United States. And he thinks, sort of like Obama was saying, you know, it's a question of I've committed to this, mm -hmm. and it's my word for this, right? And I think he's, there's a little bit of that in, in here, right? right? This is just, you know, uh, anecdotal sort of uh, speculation. I mean, he's not, he's not said this in so many words, but he's used these terms so often mm -hmm. that you sense that's what is happening. And this particularly comes about in the question of this nuclear liability stuff, which has been happening where, you know, he's been doing all kinds of really shady sort of, you know, machinations to try and please people from the other side, you know, trying to go against your own law, in a sense, okay? But that's a, a different story. The first question, I think, is, is also tells you something about the structure of policy making. So if you look at um, how energy policy is made, how electricity policy is made, these are usually made by large, you know, high-level committees. 
Um, and if you look at these committees, typically they are going to have, all of them will have representatives of the Atomic Energy Commission, right? So these guys sit there, they kind of tell you what to put in for nuclear power, right? So these committees are not going to go out and say, no, what do you think is reasonable, right? And again, I'll, sh I'll share an anecdotal thing. The last big uh, document uh, which came out uh, is the, um, in 2006, the energy, what is it called? I'm forgetting, the, I'm blanking out on the name. Um, no, it's called integrated energy policy. Thank you. Um, comprehensive integrated energy policy uh, in 2006. And uh, I had a chance to sort of meet one of the key figures who was sort of put there. And off the record, he told me, and so I'm saying this on the record here, uh, <laughs> but I'm not mentioning who it is, uh, which is that, you know, he said, look, I, I think that, you know, nuclear power is going to be there, and that's fine. Uh, but there was no way I could see nuclear power being, the, the figure in that is 2032, there'll be 63,000 uh, megawatts, 63 gigawatts, right? And so that's a huge number. And he said, look, I was willing to go up to 40, right? Uh, but these guys stuck to 63. And so he said, the reason I finally had to let go was because the guy who was sitting in from the Atomic Energy Commission said, look, we are an arm of the government. In our documents, we put 63 gigawatts. If you put something else, it looks really bad, right? And so if you're going to do that, we are going to create a stink, right? So then this guy said, okay, fine, I'll put 63 gigawatts, whatever, right? I don't care. I'm not going to be the head of the when it doesn't actually deliver, right? So there's, there's a whole question of sort of capture of these institutions or these organizations where these decisions are being made, which sort of is an important fact. Oh, yeah, I'll do next on yeah. Okay, the great talk. Uh, I think when we're talking about the feasibility, uh, whether we can finish it, the goal, maybe the history is one way. Another is uh, started for China. Uh, yeah, I think around 2005, when the China government they proposed by 2020, we have 40 gigawatts. Many people said back that because at that time China I think that's around eight mm -hmm. gigawatts. Uh, so we are, at that time we are looking at the uh, uh, whether you have enough money and also whether you have enough personnel, the secure personnel. Mm -hmm. uh, so for these two areas, have you talking about? And also another way is depend on the leadership willingness. Mm -hmm. For China, as you know, sometimes for this uh, administration, they have a high target, but uh, some such as I uh, think premier, some premier they like the water or the renewable, not nuclear, and then suddenly they slow down. For these guys, the next generation they like nuclear and then come up. So it's not consistent strategy. They depend on different administration. So the political, uh, I think their political will play some role in China and also the money and the, the such as whether China have enough material. So I try this here for the for the pressure uh, issues, right? So I'm wondering in India, I do. Yeah, um, there has been uh, certainly concern. So so first on the question of the political leadership, as I started with my talk, you know, I think there's been we've been pretty consistent, high level support. The only period when there was actually um, some um, slight cutbacks in terms of the budget. Th that is, in other words, the DAE wants a certain budget; they don't get all of it. Uh, was in the early 1990s when the country was going through this economic restructuring program. And again, Manmohan Singh used to be the finance minister. And so for a while, actually, these guys didn't, didn't like him at all uh, when he came back to power as prime minister. Uh, but uh, that aside, um, except for that one period, which they were really unhappy about, and they, uh, by and large, they've got all their budgets they want. If you look at their, that period essentially ended with 1998 uh, when, the, when they conducted the nuclear tests. Uh, and after that, their budgets have gone up and up and up, right? So, uh, so that's one thing. I don't think money has been an issue, uh, nor is it, I think, high-level political commitment. I think that's never been an issue. I think there are, uh, uh, there are problems with personnel. Uh, this is not something which is, you know, there's no official sort of thing. There are unofficial sort of remarks. One big difference, I think, is that um, when the program was set up in the 50s and 60s, it was seen as really a very uh, special place to be working in, very exciting place to be working in, and you found really bright people sort of going there, right? And increasingly, you know, all the people who are from the 90s onwards, the, the bright folks are all sort of going, and there's a constant complaint, they're all going into software, they're going into management, blah, 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 nobody comes here. And the, uh, the DAE sort of 
takes in people only from a certain program that they run, a training program that they run at the Baba Atomic Research Center, the kind of people who are coming into that program are typically what they call uh, second level, second tier cities, right? That's what their, their term is. So there's a certain thing, and there's also a, a, a sort of uh, people moving out after having been trained to go into the private sector. So that is certainly a problem that has been there. It's not been documented, it's only based on these sort of anecdotal mentions here and there that I can sort of say anything about it. Kathy, I saw you had your hand up in the back. Yes, Ramana, thank you for joining us today. This is an incredible discussion. Um, I'm wondering if you would mind elaborating uh, just briefly your view on the uh, thorium direction and sort of what you see as the status right now and what's shaping it going forward. Um, you know, thorium um, is sort of the, uh, there's, there's a joke, there was a joke in the electronics industry um, in the 90s. So, you know, f in there, the semiconductors use uh, silicon, right? Um, which is why it's called Silicon Valley. Uh, but there's this other material called germanium, right? Which, for a long time, the electronics industry used to say, that is the material that we should be using. Uh, and they'd been saying that for a long time. By the 90s, the industry had got tired of this, and they, the joke was, germanium is the material of the future, always has been, always will be, right? And I think in the nuclear industry, thorium exactly plays the same role, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's always, you know, it's a little bit less than fusion, but it's always 30 to 40 years hence, right? Um, and so if you look at the DAE's own projections and those, all those 470 gigawatts and so on, Thorium comes in in a, in a big way only after 2050, right? And so I've really not spent much time looking at that because there's just, and I mean, my, the work that I've done is mostly looking at existing things. So there is no large thorium reactor to sort of study in a sense. But th that, there's an underlying reason for that, right? And as you know, thorium by itself doesn't produce, uh, I mean, it's not fissionable, so you, you can't use it. You have to convert it into uranium-233. And when you do that conversion, what you have to do is, uh, what is produced is uranium-233 along with uh, a, another isotope of uranium called uranium-232, right? U-232 is a hard gamma emitter, right? So if you want to actually try and work with it, you have to do it behind concrete blocks so that they can block off all the gamma radiation. So you have to do your fuel fabrication remotely, things of the sort, unless you manage to lower the concentration of this U-232 to a very small extent. You can't use any chemical means to separate it out because these are isotopes. Right? And to try and use you know, centrifuges just makes it incredibly expensive. So it's the, everything about, that we know about thorium suggests that it's actually be going to be more expensive in a way. Right? And so I think the way that these people have tried to do is to say, we want to have thorium sometime in the future. So we have always had R&D programs. Uh, the, you might construct a small you know, one kilowatt reactor kind of thing. Uh, you can try to think about having thorium being burnt in situ. Uh, so in other words, you'd never try to separate out the U-233, but that's not a sort of sustainable future in a sense. That's a, it's a way to expand how much of the uranium and thorium resource you use. But that's the direction in which I think is, again, without taking a position on whether it should be there or not, if it is going to go through, that's the way I think it's going to go through. That you put it in situ and there is some amount of neutrons being absorbed. But by and large, if you look at the nuclear industry in this country, for example, they've given up on thorium breeders for a long time. But there's still a small community of, uh, I mean, there's a community of people who want to build these lifters, uh, liquid fluoride, uh, you know, thorium uh, f fluid bed reactors. And that's a separate community, and that's a right. different talk, right? Uh, but by and large, the way that people want to try to use thorium is twofold. One is that you can try to get some of its desirable properties. It has some desirable properties in terms of the, the kinds, kinds of waste it produces and, uh, you know, its non-proliferation b benefits to some extent. Uh, but you use it as along with uranium in your fuel rods. And if you go to the nuclear industry, they basically say, why do we want to bother with it? We are quite happy with uranium. Why are you coming and messing us up with trying to use thorium and stuff like that? They have no interest whatsoever in going to that, right? I think so if you want to sort of, sort of look at it from a commercial perspective, it fares very poorly. So just to clarify, it's something that Ramana mentioned. The, the, what the Indian vision has been is breeder reactors fueled with thorium on a thorium U-233 cycle, what the, the huge population of internet fanatics is mostly interested in when they say thorium is the answer to everything about nuclear energy is the molten salt reactor, uh, which is a thermal system with a 
breeding ratio are usually about 1.0 uh, with uh, thorium, and they're they're different issues for those right. two cases. But yeah. the, so every those people often say, well, India's doing it, and actually, no, India's doing no. something totally different. Totally different. That's un yeah. almost unrelated. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Thanks. That's very all right. Yeah. So you discredited the, the breeder route, um, and then you, you made a comment that you don't see a fast growth rate using sort of just the Indian heavy water reactors, or I mean, maybe even imported uh, designs for light water reactors. But what are the bottlenecks in that? Like, if you committed to just say we want to use uranium, proven technology, expand as quickly as we can. What what are the bottlenecks, and how much can you get in? I think the, the imported light water reactor route is basically constrained by economics, right? Uh, it's not going to compete against Indian coal. There are going to be no, uh, you know, unless there are, you know, India takes on kind of the climate commitments it has not done and doesn't show any signs of doing uh, in any time in the near future, uh, you know, coal is going to be there, right? And if you look at all these projections, coal is still growing, right? And it would be interesting to do a calculation of how high would the carbon price have to be before an EPR would compete, compete yes. with... Indian yes. coal. Uh, but I think the, um, so heavy water reactors, as I said, is not part of their main strategy, right? I think it can grow. It'll grow. It'll be basically constrained, I think, by the, there is not m much heavy water reactor construction capability around the world, right? Canada is only other country which is sort of doing this any significant scale. You know, China has constructed one. Romania has one, you know, a few here and there. But even the Canadians, they're not really making it anymore, right? They have not constructed a new one for a long time. Uh, they sort of lose out on all their bids at this point. Uh, so India is essentially on its own, in a sense, right? And I think, I mean, they will never admit this in public, but I think they have significant constraints, which is probably why they sort of don't talk about it in very much, right? Uh, I don't have a good handle on what that is. I don't, I cannot sort of, I can speculate, but uh, I don't think I can sort of prove anything there. Uh, but I think that uh, heavy water manufacture has been a constraint in the past. Uh, I didn't talk about that here, but you know they have had significant problems there. Right now, they have a glut because they just didn't make as many reactors as they were originally hoping to. I'm just follow, so maybe this is naive, but is there at some point does China become a potential route of importing light water reactors? I mean, that one perception is that they are now buying AP1000s. That yeah. essentially they could then start turn around and start selling to you. Is that yeah? Um, you know, China has, is, uh, it's, it's a possibility. I mean, you know, Chinese sort of walk on water in some ways uh, in the nuclear world. <laughs> and so they might actually sort of, uh, you know, produce these very cheap reactors, you know, CAP 1400s or something like that. And India could. I, I see that not happening anytime in the near future. I think it's both on the side of the Chinese. You don't see that the Chinese are bidding for a lot of things. But other than Pakistan, they have not won a single bid, right? Uh, and I think this is basically, there is a, question of, you know, people are still unsure about whether you want to buy a Chinese reactor or not, right? And, uh, the, pa and the Pakistan is arguably more a gift than a sale. Right, right. Recently, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the president of the CNC, yes. uh, they announced they were, maybe in the coming year, the demonstration of the CCP 114. Yeah. This one, they're, they're planning for, for ice park. Well, so I think the Chinese, I mean, my reading of the Chinese nuclear sector is that they have enough domestic demand at this point that they're quite, you know, they, they always talk about exports, but I don't think they're sort of putting a lot of political weight behind that, right? Because otherwise, I would not expect them, they're investing, for example, money in the British Hinkley Point project, right? That is, they're trying to uh, buy out some part of that share. Romania most recently has sort of asked the Chinese to invest in their project, right? But they're only asking for capital, right? It's an odd question to me to say, look, you know, CNNC or CGNPC is going to put in money and not asking them to buy their product, right? It suggests that I think that they themselves are not very confident to go out at yet, but they see that there's a sufficient domestic yeah. market that you build them, and then after you build a whole bunch of them, they can go out, right? right. Uh, and I think in some sense, um, Fukushima has kind of pushed their plans a little bit behind, right? because there is this decision to kind of make everything generation three plus and blah, blah, blah. So they have these new designs, ACPR and ACP, ACP which they have to still construct and you know, so on and so forth. So I think there's, that's the, uh, this thing. Um, the second issue is I think, you know, um, India will have a severe problem, uh, a sort of image problem buying from China, all right, nuclear reactors. And there's always, they always, you know, the Indian uh, nuclear scientists always ignore, Look at China, you know, they've caught, come much later and they've sort of gone ahead of us and we really need to be catching up and, 
you know, you need to tighten our belts and blah, blah, blah. So in that time to sort of turn around and say we're going to buy one from China is going to be a problem, I think. I saw a hand away in the back of the room there. This is something, you know, a, a question which I'm rather your opinion. Uh, the fact that the Indians... Uh, Practically everything I said is my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the Indian uh, weapons program, the nuclear weapons program is tightly coupled with the energy, nuclear energy uh, program in terms of technology, personnel. Uh, so how much do you think that explains the energy, uh, uh, energy department's capturing of the other institutions in terms of setting policy targets and things like that? Excellent question. Yeah. Um, I think it's extremely significant. Um, so the uh, so one of the arguments in my book and the reason I sort of called it the power of promise is that um, the DAE, the Department of Atomic Energy, um, has sort of these two uh, promises that it makes. Right. One that I've talked about a, a lot here is this idea that sometime in the future we'll generate large amounts of electricity and therefore you can have cheap electricity and blah blah blah. So that's one promise. The other is basically, you know, we're going to make nuclear weapons and we promise you perfect security with that, right? And um, these are the two sources of political power it has, right? And it has always tr traded one, I mean, they've been very careful to maintain both of them, right? So for example, the big debate during the US-India nuclear deal, uh, you could have actually seen them sort of splitting one from the other, right? And they didn't do that. So for example, when the question of trying to put the breeder reactor under safeguards came up, Many in the United States uh, were interested in that, in trying to do that, because the breeder is a very efficient producer of weapons-grade plutonium. Um, and the head of the Atomic Energy Commission comes out in a public interview uh, in the newspapers and basically he says, we can't do this. Now, this is significant in two respects. First is, you know, he, the reason he gives is that, you know, we have these two kinds of security which are going to be done with this reactor. It can give us both energy security and, uh, you know, uh, military security. And we don't want to trade one against the other. We want to keep both of them, right? So that's the reason that he talks about, which is actually, in a sense, an explicit admission that you know there is some possibility that they want to uh, use this. Now, I'm not saying they're going to use it, right? Uh, again, I think that their power derives not from actually producing material, but having the potential to produce material. So be able to promise that we can do it, right? The second is that this is the first time that I have seen where a sitting um, official, civil official, talk something about something which is being dis discussed in an international negotiation without having government clearance, right? So it speaks something to the power of the agency. And on the particular point that they talk about tells you that, you know, this question, nobody can question you, right? So in some sense, this, these two things are so difficult to come together in one. There are a lot of, uh, you know, other departments which can promise other things. You know, agricultural department can say something and mm -hmm. so on else. Industry uh, ministry can say something else. But these are the only guys who can give you these both two things together, right? In some sense, you know, the means for you know mass production, mass consumption, mass destruction, if you like. All right, I'm going to take the prerogative of the chair and, and change the subject a little bit uh, to a topic you didn't cover very much in the talk, which is safety. Okay. Um, and I'd be interested in your views on the safety picture, and in particular, we're now seeing this. Uh, troublesome situation in Korea with all of the um, sort of uh, lying about substandard parts and so on, and we now know that a majority of the Korean plants have these substandard parts that didn't actually get the safety certification they were supposed to get and so on. And there have been rumors about similar issues in India. I think I had maybe heard a rumor from you at one point about um, concrete at mm -hmm. a particular mm -hmm. site that mm -hmm. was having uh, Quote unquote, yeah. what, more, uh, more sand. sand put yeah. in it than it ought to and so on. So if you could give us a perspective on uh, safety, how effective is regulation, is there a corruption issue with substandard construction and so on? Mm -hmm. um, there are sort of, uh, let me answer the second part first. There are sort of rumors of you know, these kinds of things which have happened uh, uh, infrequently. Um, there are occasionally sort of events that happen which show that something has been substandard. So this case of this collapse of this dome is, is an example uh, where there was a design problem, right? Um, but other than that, there's been no real sort of study, you know, you know, this is not the kind of things which actually get unless you have a whistleblower in some right. sense. And for, I, for reasons which I don't quite understand, there have never been any major whistleblowers. And there have been one or two whistleblowers who have been there. Um, but they also tend to be, 
you know, on the bordering sort of on crankiness that you know, I don't know what to tr whether to trust them or not. They kind of have this conspiracy theories and it happens right. with a lot of whistleblowers in, in around the world. Yeah. And so then I don't know how to weigh their evidence, right? On the question of regulation though, I think we have much better uh, grasp of it. And you know, it's uh, clearly a captured agency uh, in that all their officials are people who have been in the thing. The one exception to that rule was the person who was here, Gopalakrishnan, mm. uh, and he got shunted out after his first term, mm -hmm. right? Um, and um, is it different now that they've sort of changed the institutional structure? No. So a bit? I'll come back to that. I'll okay. come to that. So the the the, the um, uh, and the second thing is this problem of the institutional how it is located. So the um, uh, Atomic Energy Regulatory Board, as it's called, um, answers to the uh, Atomic Energy Commission, which is the policy setting uh, agency, and which is different from the Department of Atomic Energy, which is the government department. Uh, but the head of by by the constitution of these of these organizations, the head of the uh, Atomic Energy Commission is always the head of the DAE, right? So in some sense, the uh, the Atomic Energy Regulatory Board sort of is monitoring your boss's sort of facilities. Um, this new structure which they sort of put is this national security, nuclear security regulatory authority, um, which. Uh, is sort of now answerable to a council that's headed by the prime minister, right? Um, this has good and bad points. Uh, on the one hand, the, the good point is that you're at least not directly answerable to the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, though the council does include the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, the, the bad thing is that to some extent, um, there is the question of whether other policy objectives, the foreign policy objectives, for example, will be overruled just because uh, will, will overrule any safety concerns you have. So if you know Manmohan Singh has said I'm going to buy a EPR, and the uh, the Atomic Energy Regulatory Board is going to sort of go out and do an analysis of this and say we have some concerns about safety of this. For example, in the UK they had this concern about the instrumentation and control uh, of this thing. How likely is it that you're going to say that? So this has been a, a concern that's been expressed. Finally, there's also two other problems. One problem is just what I sort of alluded to, the fact that most of its personnel are people who come in from the DAE or the Nuclear Power Corporation, right? So they have a very small staff, about 40 people or something like that, of, of trained engineers, um, which is really small compared to the kind of uh, strength they need. Um, and secondly, there are very few places outside of the uh, BARC complex where you can learn nuclear engineering, unless you happen to come abroad and get your PhD and then you go back. Um, that's one, one so this problem. The second is that their budget still comes from the same department, right? And so I'm not very sort of holding my breath for how good they're going to be. All right, well, we have come to the end of our time, if not the end of our interest. Um, so I want to thank you very much, uh, uh, Romana, for uh, joining us today. Thanks thank you very, very much. much.